Thank you so much. This is definitely a bit surreal to be uh, sharing the stage at Sages with a lot of people who are really my mentors and role models for a long time. And what I thought I'd talk to you about is a little bit of the unexpected superpowers of these vulnerable moments when they present themselves to you. Um, and if you would have asked me a decade ago um, that I'd be doing this, I certainly wouldn't have believed you, and I certainly wouldn't have believed this first slide, that I would have joint appointments as a professor in surgery, architecture, and urban planning. I mean, the most obvious giveaway is that there's a block M. Um, I grew up in Ohio for three decades, um, and so that would have been obvious that none of this could have been expected or possible. Um, that I'd have a research portfolio that would include high-impact publications and a very competitive first R01 application, um, and that I get to run my own fellowship, that I get to take architects and urban planners from around the world and train them in health services researchers. Um, none of that would have been expected, and if you told me a decade ago that was gonna happen to me, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, but the only thing maybe more unbelievable and more unexpected were sort of the next three trilogy of failures that happened, um, and that were pretty shattering and kind of rattled uh, my cage pretty well. And um, I thought I'd just share them with you and tell you kind of what came out of them. And uh, they were both things for the way I developed in my career, um, and also the way I think differently about mentees when they come to me and ask for career advice. Um, so it was not off to a great start in medical school. Uh, quite early, I failed my boards, and maybe not unexpectedly did not match in the residency match program. Um, and everyone I reached out to kind of said the same thing. Like, are you sure you want to be a surgeon? Um, and a lot of them echoed the comments that Dr. Dimmick uh, kind of articulated, you know, surgeons don't have crises of confidence. Surgeons don't doubt themselves. How are you gonna fit in with that group? So I reached out pretty wide and cast my net pretty far. Um, and I did what things in people in Ohio don't do, is um, I drove across the straight line to Michigan um, to then assistant professor Justin Dimmick about a decade ago. Um, and he was one of the few people who was willing to sit down with me. And he said, if you come to Ann Arbor, um, I'd be happy to give you career advice. So I borrowed my parents' tow to Camry. Uh, drove up north on a Saturday in February, um, and that was the first time I got to see what my career could actually look like um, if I stuck to it. So he introduced me to a number of surgical organizations where I got to see how my role might fit into academic surgery and meet these different phenotypes, and by going to those meetings, I met this collection of people. I think many of you would recognize these people as world leaders in our field, high-impact papers, high-impact research groups, chairs running large organizations. But what you may not know about all of them is actually all four of those people also didn't match. Or also people who at the end of medical school were told to rethink careers in surgery. And um, I really leaned into that. I reached out to those people and said, hey, I'm just like you. I don't think they bought it initially. <laughs> um, but it actually turned um, these common failures into a community. and. I didn't really realize what was happening, but as I sort of went back and thought about that, like, what if I hadn't filled my boards? Like, what if I did great on my boards and matched in a residency? Would I have ever gone on that road trip on a Saturday? Would I have ever leaned into my mentors and been super vulnerable to say, like, hey, everyone around me thinks I'm going the wrong way, and like, I need a lot of help? I probably wouldn't have. Um, and I think my career, everything that's happened since, probably wouldn't have happened had I passed my boards. Um, and probably the best part about the community is not just the people that I reached out to and leaned into, but it's the ones who reach out to me. So I've been pretty open about not doing well in the match program. And um, I'd say every one to two weeks, I get an email that starts like this. And Dear Dr. Brahim, I wasn't sure who else to reach out to, but uh, I also didn't match. And um, my administrative assistant is a numbers junkie who's like the most type A organized person. And in my first year on faculty, I had almost 300 hours of mentoring time. And I think what I'm most proud of of that is a number of those people started with saying, I didn't know who else to talk to. I didn't know what other office to go to. Um, so it's created a community both above me of mentors I can lean into, uh, but also a group of mentees who um, have so much untapped potential who can do a lot for our field. Um, that now potentially see a way for them to contribute. Um, and so the first kind of superpower is that it builds your community, both kind of the way you lean into your mentors that the vulnerability allows you to do, uh, but also makes you more accessible to your mentees. Um, so after that, I subsequently did a prelim year, um, which was a lot of 
fire, trial by fire, um, and subsequently matched into a categorical program. And my enthusiasm for that was really tempered by the fact that I had to redo intern year. And I was like, man, I like just got through intern year. Like, you mean I have to do that again? So I called Dr. Dimmick, um, who graciously gave me his phone number, and I'm not totally sure why, but I definitely used it a lot. And uh, I said, hey, like, I'm really proud of myself for getting through intern year, but I don't think I can do that again. And he very profoundly said, you know, failure is the crucible of great leaders. And I you know, took a deep pause, and I said, you know, that's really profound, and I need to take that in. And after I hung up the phone, I looked up what a crucible was, because I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, there are multiple definitions. I naturally gravitated toward the one that's most related to architecture. Um, and a crucible uh, of many definitions is actually the container that you heat up metals in. And its unique properties is that it can withstand the heat to purify a metal uh, without getting damaged itself. And the process of being exposed to a lot of heat um, and then cooling off in a lot of heat is actually what makes like the strongest metals in the world um, and tempers alloys. And I thought, all right, Dr. Dimmick's on to something. So I kind of went back into my second intern year and realized that like, besides taking a lot of ICU and vascular call, which I think I got like a disproportionate share of, um, it was also a year about clinical mastery. And I met a lot of great residents who just had all these pearls. And I just obsessed and wrote all of them down every day I came home being like, this is what it means to like immerse in your field and love your work. Um, and by the end of that second year, I had over 300 pages of notes of just all the things that I wanted to remember to be a clinical master um, in this space. And looking back, I thought, had I just been successful my first intern year, I don't know that I would have had the same mastery. I don't know that I would have gone as deep as I did. And um, maybe a lot of people got there in one year and I needed two, and that was fine. Um, but I don't think it would have happened had I not had to go through it twice. Um, so I like to think I'm a little bit of an expert about being an intern. So I always volunteer to give the common intern calls to the incoming residents. And um, it's usually a lot of things that I messed up, um, things that you shouldn't say when you get paged, like I don't know who that patient is and kind of hang up. Um, or there's no way I can take another patient, I'm too swamped. Like we've all said it. And um, I love sort of pointing that out to the interns, but. I think what occurred to me as I gave that talk multiple times um, is I had to add one more slide, and it's um, to be kind to yourself. The learning curve of um, becoming a surgeon is tough, and going through two intern years like, really underscored that for me. Um, and it was just great to look at the mentees and be like, hey, you're supposed to mess up a central line a couple times. Like, get the first three or four down, probably means the fifth one is when you're gonna mess up. Um, and it sort of normalized this idea of how hard the process was. Um, so the sort of second superpower, whether you sort of realize it's happening or not, is that it really tempers your ability, um, in part to sort of hone in your excellence and become that stronger metal by sort of failing and getting chances to recover, um, but also just developing a deeper empathy for your learners and what they're going through is they're going through the learning curve that you're kind of now far removed from. Um, and the last is sort of one that I think resonates pretty deeply um, with me. So I think if you asked any of us, we all probably have some crazy to-do list that looks like this, whether it's in our mind or written down. And I think the only person who I thought maybe had a busier to-do list than me was my older brother. Um, so we are very much the same person. We went to the same college, same med school. Uh, he was my first phone call for everything, my best friend. Uh, that was us at my uh, graduation. And um, I remember visiting him about three years ago, and he's just telling me all the things he was doing. He had started his own practice, he was building up another office, he was starting new procedures, building out a textbook. And I kind of just started thinking like, maybe you're just doing too much. Like, what are you chasing after? Like, why are you doing all those things? It just seemed like too much. And kind of unbeknown to us, he'd actually developed a pretty um, significant addiction problem. Um, and was um, found dead from an overdose that year. And uh, I would say no matter how uh, busy your to-do list, when your cage gets rattled like that, um, your list gets clarified very quickly. So mine came down to really two things, uh, getting in a car and driving to my parents' house, and then ignoring everything else <clears throat> on the list. And um, 
at that time, I was finishing up chief year, about to decide if I was going into fellowship or applying for a job, and I really had to clarify like my values. Like, in a way, it was a blessing that like my whole plate got cleared off. And all of a sudden, I think like, what do I actually want? Like, I don't want to chase a bunch of things that aren't going to make me happy. I kind of saw how that played out. Um, and I realized, well, one thing that was important to me was just being close to my family. Um, second, I realized I really loved the idea of becoming a general surgeon. I didn't necessarily want to do a fellowship and do a lot of procedures that I didn't enjoy. I really loved the idea of being a general surgeon. Um, and I needed a creative outlet for my research and design work. And it was startling to me that I'd gone so far in my training and had never been able to articulate those values and those goals that I cared about. And it was only kind of after that moment where things got pretty destabilized where I was like, yeah, that is what I want, and that is what I want to go after. Um, and so that certainly helped me with sort of identifying what the right first job for me was. But I'm really fortunate to get a lot of um, residents and med students who come to me and want to spend their two years of research time with me. And um, I get really suspicious or nervous when I hear a really long to-do list, when I hear really long, ambitious goals. And so we've started to put some safeguards into it. So um, with my mentees, anytime we do two projects, we pause and just use the next meeting to talk about like, what are your goals and values and are we moving in that direction? Like, are we losing sight just chasing shiny objects or are we actually doing things that reflect your core values? And once that's realigned, then we can move ahead with the next couple of projects. So in summary, I think uh, vulnerable moments give you some leadership superpowers. It builds your community both in the way that you lean into mentors uh, and the way that you become more accessible to mentees. Uh, it tempers your ability, both in kind of your own clinical excellence, but also developing empathy for your learners. Um, and it clarifies your values. Uh, it gets you true to your own mission, uh, but also surfaces your mentees' values if you're deliberate to think about it and listen for it. So that I'll say thank you and go blue um, and pass on to the next speaker. Thank you.